Uh, in, in this instance, um, uh, Bob Glenn will, will give the first opening. Uh, Matt Castlin will then follow. When we close, it will be the opposite. Uh, Matt Castlin will give the, the first closing. Bob Glenn will give the, the last closing. Uh, we'll, we're going to give a little bit more time for, for, uh, quite for answers here because uh, of a smaller field, and we'll also have a bit of a rebuttal. So the way this will work is, for example, if I ask the first question to Bob Glenn, he will have 90 seconds to answer. When he is finished, Matt Castlin will have two minutes to, to answer. He can then rebut anything that, that, that Bob may have said. It will then go back to Bob Glenn for, 30, for a 30 second rebuttal if he chooses to take it. If he chooses not to, we'll just move on to the next question. Questions are gonna be very similar uh, to, um, to what you just heard. Uh, the, the issues pertain to the Senate the same way they pertain to the House. We just decided to split this up so that um, it would be easier to differentiate between uh, Senate and House and also because we were um, expecting a, a, a bigger crowd for the House and, and um, though a few of them didn't show up, it would have been difficult to, ha to have had everyone up here at once. So with that being said, uh, we will go ahead and start um, with our opening statements and uh, Bob Glenn will go first. Well, first off, thanks to all of you for coming out and thank you to the Chamber and uh, to Matt and to Ms. Boone for running our operation tonight. Thank you. Uh, I can't emphasize enough that uh, this is a critical election for the Commonwealth. Uh, our middle class is under attack, our public schools are under attack, the poor are under their attack, and in many ways our future is in doubt. And the reason that that is the case is because unlike taking the philosophy of Abraham Lincoln that if you fail to plan, you plan to fail, this legislature was desperate to do things and they did. Uh, they destroyed programs that help uh, the poor. They devastated programs for working families. They harmed public education and continued a trend that has occurred over the last decade, particularly in terms of secondary education. And they harmed cities and counties with their solution to pensions. Now, I think we can come up with some great solutions with bipartisan uh, cooperation that can move our state forward. But we need a change on November 6th, and I ask for your support to do just that. Matt Caslin. Good evening. Thank you all for being here tonight. My name is Matt Caslin. I took office in 2017 for the first time in my life because I was sick and tired of the direction of Kentucky. I looked up and I seen the morals that uh, Christian individuals in our community being taken advantage of. I looked up, people didn't have the backbone to stand for the unborn children. All these things started changing in 2017. Our economy is booming right now. $17 billion in new investment, 17,000 new jobs. People talk about being a critical election. It is because for the first time in Kentucky's history, we turned it around and have some of the greatest economy we've experienced, the lowest unemployment rate we've seen in Kentucky's history. And if you want to continue down the same path of economical growth, I encourage you to vote for Matt Castle on November 6. Thank you. Okay, we'll start with the same question that we started with in the House race, and that focused on the uh, 6%. Uh, you're you're, you're going to start first. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, and you'll get 90 seconds, 2 minutes, and then 30 seconds. Um, we'll, we will focus on the 6% the services tax that, that uh, went into effect as part of the uh, broader tax reform in the last legislative session. And as I said before, uh, uh, you know, we've heard from some of the, the businesses who, who, are, who are upset with that, whether it be concern over how it's being enforced, am I paying, are they not paying, also over why are my services, whether that be lawn care, dry cleaning, whatever, being taxed and someone else's uh, are not. So um, uh, as a challenger, I'll ask you uh, how you would have voted uh, on that legislation, and when we get to you, I will ask you, uh, to explain your vote on it. Uh, also, do you think it is something that needs to be revisited, whether that be, and, it, and is that revisiting being repealed, or is it just simply adding more services, legal, medical, whatever that may be? So, Bob Lynn, you have 90 seconds to. 
I think this tax was an attempt. You may recall they were going to cut K through 12 education at the last possible second. Uh, they came up with this funding formula not only to fund pensions, but also to fund K through 12 education. It was a desperate attempt to come up with money because they weren't engaging in real tax reform that, that helped the middle class and helped working families. In fact, your average tax bill in the state of Kentucky is going to go up this year, not only because of what they did, but also because of what the fed, federal system will do. We've lost uh, 10000 dollars of credit for pensions. It's gone from 41000 to 31000 You will look at the way the federal tax system is structured. You can't get more than a $10,000 credit for paying your state income taxes. So all of us are going to pay more in state income taxes. My concern with this 6% tax is it picked winners and losers. And even the incumbent state senator has said that publicly. Uh, I can't emphasize enough that one of the issues you've got is aluminum processing and welding weren't one on the list, and I wonder why. Uh, I would also suggest to you that it is not a good idea to allow these folks to have another bite at the apple, because what's going to happen is they're going to tax groceries and pharmaceuticals. If they truly want to go to a state income tax, nothing will be spared. And I can tell you it'll be a tremendously regressive process if you begin taxing groceries and pharmaceuticals. So the 6% tax needs to be revisited. It either needs to be fair or it needs to be removed and replaced with other income streams. Matt Castle, you have two minutes to, to answer that and respond to anything he said. You know, our tax code is uh, very outdated, and uh, I think there's a group of people in Kentucky and a lot of the citizens that want to move towards a consumption-based process, which is a six- to eight-year process because we lowered the income tax. And unlike my opponent, who has a hard time understanding tax reform, we lowered income tax from six and a quarter percent down to five for the majority, about 90-something percent of all Kentuckians. With the taxes on service moving us towards a consumption-based tax, that's the direction in Kentucky that we're taking. It's the first step. Is there some improvements that have to happen? Absolutely. That's why it's a 68-year process because we have to run a balanced budget. But unlike my opponent here who's never passed the opportunity to raise property taxes and other things to fund his million-dollar concrete trees, I'm working towards a fair tax system that will work for everybody in Kentucky. And Bob Glenn, you have 30 seconds to respond if you'd like to. Four of the six years I've been a city commissioner, I've been proud to never have to raise taxes, particularly property taxes. I'd cut my right arm off before I would propose a, a tax increase that was unneeded. So I really think that's uncalled for. I can't emphasize enough that the biggest issue we got is we've restored flood control in this city. Uh, we have brought new jobs to this city, over 8,000 in the last five years, and they're good paying jobs. We've improved the quality of life in this community. We've made investments that have made Owensboro a great place to raise a child, a great place place to work and a great place to have a small business. There just isn't any excuse to say that when you raise taxes, it has to be for a negative purpose. Our community is moving forward because of the decisions and investments we've all made. And I'm proud of the progress Owensboro's made. And I'm sorry my opponent doesn't think that progress is worthy of celebration. OK, uh, follow up on that a, a little bit. And, and uh, again, we'll switch the order. Matt, you'll go first. Bob, you'll respond. And, and then you'll get to the, the rebuttal. Um, we talked about this earlier as well. want to focus on uh, the impact that the, the tax bill had on nonprofits uh, in particular, uh, how their fundraisers are, are, are now taxed. Um, where do you stand on that and, and what, if anything, needs to be done to, to uh, correct that issue? Well, and, and understanding the process versus LRC versus the revenue cabinet whenever a bill is passed, the interpretation come down from the revenue cabinet after the law was passed in, in the spring. And so there's already been a pre-filed bill that's going to take place because I don't think anybody in Frankfurt wanted to see our nonprofits had to pay taxes. And so that's going to be taken care of right away. The biggest thing is that there was a group of people in Frankfurt who had enough backbone to step up and try to do tax reform over a lengthy process so that we do get it right and we are willing to go back and try to adjust it to make it work for all of us Kentuckians and to see that our small businesses, our nonprofits, and everybody have a fair tax code. Thank you. Bob Glenn. Keep in mind that 95% of Kentuckians are going to pay more in state income taxes next year. And I had a conversation with uh, Catholic High, uh, the folks that run their sports programs, and, and the director of their, uh, their uh, basically their concession stand said that $3,000 was having to be paid uh, each month out of their, their funds that they never had to pay before. That's because these folks were in such a hurry to show they could do something, anything, to impress their, their handlers 
and to impress though the five percent that are going to get a major tax break out of this this reform we need real tax reform and yes there is a bill pre-filed and I'm glad you're going to correct the mistake that's been made but are these folks going to get their money back Will we go back and refund that money? Uh, I'd like to hear my opponent respond to that, and I'm sure he will in a rebuttal. The other issue is that when we look at tax reform, we need it to be equitable. Corporations should pay their fair share, and that's not happening now, even with the changes they've made. But to say that Kentuckians are going to pay less in taxes in terms of state income taxes than the 41 taxes my opponent has imposed on average working Kentuckians, uh, there's no savings here for the average working family. There's only more cost. Matt Castle. Are you going to return the taxes of property taxes on your million dollar concrete trees and they're paid for? You know, there again, we lowered income tax from six and a quarter to five percent. We're moving towards a consumption based tax form, which at that point is a choice by each individual citizen. If you're rich or poor, you have the choice of what you buy and you pay taxes on that. Thank you. Okay, uh, Bob, you will start uh, this question, and, and we're going to focus on um, the what what they call the bathroom bill. And, and just a reminder, uh, you know, this is a chamber focused uh, uh, um, debate, and and we want to to come at this from the from the business perspective of it. So, uh, you know, other states who have who have passed uh, what could be considered. Um, uh, you know, socially controversial uh, uh, bills. The business community has talked about the the impact that has had on the state's economy. Where do you stand uh, on, on on that? And 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 in general, where do you stand on the bathroom bill in particular? And then broader, where do you stand on uh, uh, socially divisive bills and in, in how they may uh, impact a uh, state's economy? The most important issue is that we bring businesses to our state that benefit everyone. And when you take a wedge issue like the bathroom bill, like the one that D.J. Johnson co-sponsored, I noticed him backing away up here big time from being sponsor of the bill. But let me quote one of your, your leaders in the Republican Party who said, uh, Matt Bevan himself said, we don't need to tell people where to go to the bathroom. Uh, this is a ludicrous bill. We saw it cost the governor of North Carolina, Republican, his job. Bruce Springsteen canceled a, co uh, a concert there. The NC2A threatened to pull out of all the playoff games they were going to have in cities in North Carolina. Conventions were canceled and two companies that were planning to move plants to North Carolina left. Do we really want to do that to Kentuckians over a wedge issue like this? I mean, I deal, I teach students of all persuasions. I have a student who recently came up to me who said she's converting from being female to male. I don't view that student by their gender. I view them by their humanity. And what I'm here to do as your state senator is represent every person in the Commonwealth. These kind of bills that are being proposed will harm our state economically, they'll harm our image, will be viewed as a backward state, and will be viewed as a state that doesn't believe in the equality of all individuals. And I'm a Christian, and I believe that if Jesus Christ came down, he would be against this because it's discrimination. There are all kinds of ways you can address this issue. Jim Glenn mentioned doing a study. I think that's reasonable. But the biggest thing is we do not want the black eye that North Carolina absorbed with their proposal to basically discriminate against people because of their gender choice. Choice. Matt Caslin. I'm unapologetic about my Christian views, and I was a co-sponsor of the bill. Because if you're a boy and you're born a boy, go to the boys' restroom. If you're a girl and you're born a girl, go to the girls' restroom. You know, I'm a firm believer. I put my moral values before I do my economic values. And this is a situation in Kentucky with a five-year-old and an eight-year-old child. I don't want to have to answer to my kid of why they have to share the bathroom with someone of the opposite sex. And it's that simple. To make an issue out of something like this, and if it offends somebody economically and they don't want to come to our state, they need to reevaluate maybe where they're at in life. This is a simple situation that can be put to bed by simply saying, if you're a boy, you go to the boy's bathroom. If you're a girl, you go to the girl's bathroom. If you don't know, go at home. Thank you. My response to that is that many bathrooms are cross-gender already. And this is a ludicrous red herring issue brought up to divide us instead of unite us. 
it is absolutely essential that we look to the long term. We have so many important problems in this state, from the opioid epidemic uh, to the fact that workers are not making a living wage to the fact that some people don't have decent housing in this state. To me, those are my priorities, and I believe as a Christian, those are the issues this state Senate and our legislature should be focusing on. And even your governor agreed that this is a red herring and is not worthy of debate and discussion and wasting the tax dollars of the Commonwealth to even uh, debate it. Okay, Matt, you you will go first on on this question, and and I'm going to switch it up a little bit. And earlier I asked about home rule. I'm going to kind of narrow it down a little uh, a little more than that, and and talk about local option sales tax, and um, uh, and what the, essentially for those of you who who may not know what that means, it, it basically allows local governments to to uh, pass a tax um, a sales tax, usually up to one percent, uh, that would be used to fund various projects, whether it be transportation, uh, downtown development, whatever. Um, wh why, does, uh, why does Kentucky continue to not allow local option sales tax uh, when it's a tool available to local governments in a vast majority of states nationwide? And will you work with, with the city, county, and chamber who have all expressed support for this to get a bill uh, heard and passed? You know, I'm a firm believer, no taxation without representation. And I think local option sales tax, uh, somewhat accomplishes that with the voters being able to choose uh as home rule goes i think there's i think home rule in smaller government is a better thing for our community but i think there's also three branches of government for a reason that our forefathers thought out in the federal government the state government and our local government so i think this is a situation here depending on the issue like local option sales tax for example if it was something for municipalities fixing our water system that we have here in our community and things like that i don't have an issue with it but it's for adding taxes to things that we don't necessarily need then yes i have an issue with it so it's one of those things depending on the subject depending on the issue i think it's something that we would look at at that point thank you bob glenn yeah, from a business perspective, the Kentucky League of Cities has been advocating getting rid of the class system for over a decade. Uh, it's a uh, outdated system. It discriminates against rural and western cities in extreme western and eastern Kentucky, and it's time is uh, come to abandon it. Uh, there's no doubt, and I'll agree with Matt, that if you're going to give cities and counties additional tax and revenue options, they should be put to a vote of the people. And I'll give you the example where that failed. In Madisonville, they, passed, they, they imposed a restaurant tax. Uh, they didn't do a vote of the people and the mayor uh, David Jackson an up-and-coming star in the Republican Party was defeated for re-election in the primary I think it's very very important that people have a voice we've had tax initiatives before where we have gone through and taken a tremendous amount of time assessing what people want and what they want that money spent for and I can tell you that the most proud thing uh, that I focused on is the flood control uh, investments we've made in this community over 10 million dollars so people in that fairgrounds area of Owensboro do not have raw sewage flooding in their homes during the type of rain we've experienced but I think cities and counties are not well served by this legislature the 12 percent increase in our pension contributions we paid it this year that's why we had a property tax increase folks to fund a state mandate and that increase will incur next year the year after the year after that and the year beyond that is not a, fit, a resolvable or intractable solution for cities and counties it will bankrupt some cities and counties in the Commonwealth so that's absolutely critical we need to focus on the fact that when we look at home rule and classes we need to eliminate it and allow cities much more autonomy to uh, gather new streams of revenue matt you have 30 seconds if you'd like it once again incompetence of understanding law uh the pension uh for the local communities was pushed down because they changed the assumptions not by the legislative body but because of the retirement board and we passed has we passed house bill 362 which helped phase in the pension calls for local government so there again uh, my opponent uh, had that backwards and didn't understand it thank you last question will focus on education and and um what I kind of want to talk about again is how it relates to workforce development. And so what do you see the role uh, of public education in Kentucky's workforce development being? And what do you see your role as a legislator, legislator in the equation? And Bob, you're first. first okay. Well, it's absolutely essential uh, in terms of developing the workforce of tomorrow. As a city commissioner, I helped fund the uh, Industrial Innovation Center at Owensboro Community College, and the county did the same. That was a million dollars invested to train workers for the jobs at today and tomorrow, including some that may work at Mr. Castle and Steel Plant. 
Uh, the other issue is trying to speed up the education process so that we get people employable more quickly. We've done that with TechX, uh, with GoFame, uh, with a number of programs that get workers trained even without a two-year or four-year degree, just a certificate or diploma, a package of classes, if you will, that gets them into the workforce so they can work at Unifirst and Kimberly-Clark and other places. In fact, some of our students have been grabbed up before they finish completion of the program. So that's critical. But you can't continue to cut two-year and four-year education. I've watched over 30 staff members and faculty lose their jobs at Owensboro Community College, and there were hundreds across the state. And we continue to be the whipping boy for budget cuts. Uh, where do you think they got the $3.1 billion for pensions? They robbed it from universities and colleges. That's robbing from our future. So it's absolutely essential that we, if we're going to say that education matters and education pays, that we properly fund it at all levels, K through 12 and secondary. More importantly, we need to also teach soft skills, and we need to encourage people to not necessarily go get a college degree. I agree with Matt in the sense that a trade or a skilled uh, workforce track is a good idea, and we have a shortage of plumbers, electricians, and people in the trades. And I definitely support funding and programs that move us forward in that direction. Okay, Matt, you have two minutes for this. Workforce development is something I'm very passionate with because I deal with it every single day. Long before I was in politics, I was one of the founding board members of GoFame here in our community. And as we do things in Kentucky, as we grow our economies, we attract businesses, we have to make sure that we're at the forefront of workforce development because we got to have people fill the jobs and continue to take with the growth. Workforce development in our community is something that we can partner with with our businesses. Myself, the individual, was just sitting over here just a few minutes ago. I've seen it change a guy's life for the better because I partnered with a community college and helped write the curriculum that educated a student to where now when they come to work three days a week, he went to school two days a week, he got to take what he learned in the classroom and implement it in the workplace. He got to take what he learned in the workplace and implement it at the classroom. It's a great way partnering with our local companies to help write a curriculum moving forward that best fills the workforce need that we have in Kentucky. And as a focus of a legislator, I think we need to make sure that we put the focus towards our trades in our communities now because I feel like for years and years we've not had the focus in those areas and that's where the shortage of workers is coming from today. Thank you. Bob, you have 30 seconds. I work with our local trades unions to create a relationship where plumbers and pipe fitters do training with the community college. I've been involved with the Kentucky Innovation Network to have students compete in an entrepreneurial contest, contest called Idea State, and we won that contest for business model two years ago, a community college beating even graduate students at WKU in Louisville, and that's a credit to our students. So I can't emphasize enough that it's very, very important that we properly fund all tracks of education. If We are still going to need social workers and teachers and counselors and accountants and that means a four-year degree we also need tradespeople but the budget cuts and basically the 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 criminalization of of secondary ed where we don't seem to matter to the governor and we don't seem to mean to that matter to this party have to stop okay we will move on to closing statements and Matt Castlin you will be first you know even though we hear the the doom and gloom from my opponent here it's an exciting time in Kentucky and that's why he's trying to fool you all to think that it's not. We passed tax reform that lowered income taxes for all of our family. It moved us from 33rd to 18th in the country. We increased seek formula to $4,000 per child, highest in Kentucky's history. We fully funded our pensions at $3.4 billion. We passed House Bill 1 to streamline the adoption process so that our most precious children can have a loving home. We passed a bill to help our farmers when they transport their goods back and forth in raw commodities. We passed six pro-life bills, the ultrasound bill. We defunded Planned Parenthood for the first time in Kentucky's history. We banned the dismemberment abortions. We helped by honoring our pregnancy centers and bringing attention to them here in Kentucky. And right now we have the all-time unemployment low in Kentucky. $17 billion in new investment. New investment means more jobs. More jobs means more wealth for individuals in our community. $3 billion more in exports in Kentucky. Listen to these numbers, people. The numbers don't lie. The facts don't lie. We have made Kentucky a better place. Bob Glenn. Well, that may be true in the Golden Triangle, but it's simply not true here. We brought jobs in here that are paying an average of $11 an hour, and that frustrates me as a city commissioner, and it will be something that may, is a key focus in my service as a state senator. The most important thing to remember is that 
he and his party have devastated the landscape for working families. He co-sponsored workman's comp devastation. They took, they imposed right to work. Uh, they got rid of prevailing wage. They've ripped money out of the pockets of middle class families. There may be more jobs, but I would suggest to you they don't pay well and the benefits are not enough to raise a family on, put groceries on the table, pay a mortgage. We need jobs in an economy that works not just for corporations and millionaires, but also for working people. And if I'm your state senator, that's what we'll focus on. We'll also focus on properly funding education and fixing the pension mess that was created in this last session of the legislature. I'm here to focus on working families and rebuilding the middle class. And if you agree with me that we need a voice in Frankfurt to do that, please support me on November 6th. Thank all of you for coming tonight. It's a wonderful crowd. Thank you to the Chamber for sponsoring such a wonderful event. Uh, I, I agree with that. Uh, while we're on that topic, uh, uh, we should all thank Candace and, and her staff for, for putting this together. Uh, just so you know, one of the candidates in the House debate came up afterwards and, and said of all these he's done, he thought it was the best format that, that he had been at. So that's a credit to you guys and, and, and all the hard work that you do. So good job. Yeah. And thank you all for being here. And, and everyone remember to vote on November 6th.